Hi, my name is Mary Williams, and I have been an artist all my life. Um, I, uh, I uh, started drawing in young childhood, and uh, oh, there's my cat. This is Doodle. <laughs> you can stay. He's checking it out. I have a bunch of things on my desk for to just um, refer to, and uh, she may have gotten interested. So, um, yeah, I've been doing art since uh, early childhood. Um, I used to love coloring books and uh, all kinds of things, paper dolls, anything I could just um, get my hands on, cut out. Uh, color in. Um, I started out, my favorite thing to do was uh, drawing flowers. I was uh, very influenced by George O'Keefe uh, when I was a kid. So flowers were my big medium when I was young. And uh, so, yeah, she was a big influence on me uh, throughout my life. And uh, um yeah, I just, I was one of those kids that never, um, never stopped drawing. I think at a certain age, people think that, you know, young kids, you know, you move on to sports or, um, you know, whatever you want to do in your free time. But um, I've always just gone to drawing as, as my sort of go-to activity. And uh, I was, I was a ballet dancer for a long time when I was a, a child up until I was a teenager. And so that was always a, a focal point in my life as well. Um, I was pretty busy as a teenager. I was very much into ballet and at school I took, you know, as many drawing classes and art classes as I could. And uh, so that's where my great great love for the arts started and I've always loved art history as well. It's always been sort of a, a big influence on some of my work and uh, it's always good to, you know, learn from the past and pick your favorites and your influences and yeah, so that's, that's my youth. Um, <laughs> and uh, now I'm trying to just, um, make it my life's work um to be an artist and it's it's been very hard <laughs> i've done a bunch of different things um artistically uh to keep myself going and um it's not always been easy but um i've still just kept at it um right now i have um uh, i have a job at trader joe's where i uh I do a lot of their signage, uh, everything from like small shelf signs to like big end cap boards, um, plus, you know, painting windows and, and all kinds of like things you never think you'll, <laughs> you'll end up doing as an artist. But that's a lot of, um, it's a lot of handwriting. It's a lot of uh, creative, um, creative work with markers mostly and pens and, and trying to think of, you know, fun uh, points to bring out about any kind of product we have, a new product or, a, you know, highlighting an, an old favorite, you know. So um, that's what I do three days a week for mostly just for, to, um, to get a regular income. Um, I do have a business and it's right now it's kind of, uh, at a sort of a standstill. I promote it on my Instagram. Oh, I try to keep it current and uh, show what new things that I'm working on. Um, I work in phases, so I usually have um, three or four to five pieces at a time I'm working on. Um, so it's hard to say how long one piece takes, um, but I usually end up with, you know, at a within like a few weeks, I'll have a bunch of new, a new pieces to put up on the, in my shop.
Yeah, so that's that. It's been difficult, I think, because of maybe because of the um, pandemic. I think people, it's, you know, art is definitely not a, a necessity. Um, but I do try to keep my prices pretty fair. And um, sometimes I think they're not high enough. But I, uh, I have been getting commissions uh, here and there. Um, but it's been pretty, pretty slow, uh, it's sort of, it's been sort of disheartening. And, uh, one thing I decided to do, uh, recently is to advertise. So I'm going to have a half page advertisement in Catster magazine starting in the September, October issue. And I'm going to do that for, uh, three months and see how that affects my business i'm just hoping to you know widen my audience um get more people interested in commissions and and into interested in the other things that i make um that i've sort of turned my original art into prints and cards and, and things to sort of um make it easier on myself it's just doing the the originals it does take time and I think, you know, people see an original that they like and, you know, you can't make several of the same um, to sell. So it's so having um, being able to make prints is uh, is very good for uh, for someone like myself. <laughs> You know, I, I didn't start out as a as a cat lady. I, I never had any cats when I was a kid and uh it just so happened my um in college one of my friends had had cats and she was like, You should get a cat because I lived alone and you know, it gets pretty lonely, you know, even when you're busy with school and everything. So I got a cat named Felix and he was very independent and he was you know, he would sometimes be loving, but mostly he had his own agenda. And he, 
he was a cat to sort of admire. He was very big. He was like 18 pounds, just a big cat. And he was all black. And he was just so soft. And, uh, you know, I had him for uh, almost 15 years. And then um, I still had him when I met my husband. And uh, he became sort of Brian's cat, my husband Brian. He, uh, he would sit and cuddle with with Brian a lot more than me and you know cats you know choose they they sort of own you and um I think that's pretty that's kind of special it's different from from dogs and that constant you know validation that they love and cats are just uh you know very very unique and each cat is you know different from the other ones it's very there's not a certain, I don't know, cat type that people like to uh, make fun of the cat lady, but it's it's actually become sort of a uh, little patch of honor to, to be a cat lady. And um, yeah, I've definitely appreciated like looking at cats depicted through art throughout the centuries. Um, Egyptian art is full of so many beautiful like sculptures and and uh, I did a I did one piece that was I don't know if you can see it. maybe I'll take it out of the I did it on a um, so this is the print of it the original was on a cabinet door that this was like the size of it. It was sort of like a small um, kitchen cabinet door. And it had this sort of, you know, it looked kind of sad to begin with, but I I, uh, spray, I sanded it, spray painted it gold. And so the, the edge was gold around here. And then I, um, when you add the paper, you kind of have to plan what you're doing. So I used, you know, different, you can kind of see where the paper, where I uh, patched in the paper, but with a pattern, you can sort of hide that that patching and make it look like an overall pattern pretty easily. Um, and then this was spray painted gold as well. And this were both at the same the same plane. And then this was sort of like a little dremeled out um, decorative carving into the cabinet so I kept that gold and I added some uh, some um, little hieroglyphics some of which I think I kind of I mostly followed like you know traditional hieroglyphics but I think some things I added on my own like this little the little infinity symbol the eight on its side um, and I added some little um, copper and sort of silvery doodads that I had and the cat was just it was a a cat that was it was a friend of mine it was his parents cat and I loved the picture because the cat had this sort of glow about it like the sort of this hind leg and then the face was really glowy and and I thought that's that could be a, a cat that would be worshipped <laughs> so I call this one cat worship and uh, yeah, the original was was one of those was one of those collages that I call like a showstopper. That you know, when I would show it at a at a cat convention or something, people would be like, "Wow," you know. And it helps sell the um, it helps to sell the print, even if people don't want to buy the uh, the original. Um, so yeah, dealing with uh, with the subject of cats has been just really fun. They just, you know, each, and you get people who are fans of certain kinds of cats, like the, right now I think the exotic, the exotic short hair is really having a moment. Those are the cats with the, they have the eyes and the nose sort of in the same, <laughs> in the same line on their face. And they have like a, like this sort of mustache um, 
mouth shape that sort of looks like they're smiling or looks like they're grumpy or it it's just very um very irresistible and a lot of those cats are really um really taken off on instagram so i i did these two I don't know if you can see. Let's see. Um, but these two, if you see the the little funny little face shapes, and sometimes they have their tongues out all the time. And um, these two are having tea. So those are those are really popular cats. And one kind of cat that I really like is um, the Sphinx cat. And I follow this one group called I think it's called Sphinx Swag. And they make clothes for um, for the hairless sphinx cats because sometimes they, you know, in order to feel secure or warmth, you know, in their daily life, they they wear sometimes like a like a shirt sort of thing, loose fitting shirt. And um, I decided to uh, draw the cat, and then I sort of gave it its own little clothing with the with this sort of rainbow ribbon, which was, it was really difficult to work with to try to make clothing with a, with a ribbon and try to, you know, make it look like it's folding and. Um, yeah, but those cats are just, they're very regal. They're very stylish. Um, if you've ever pet one, they're so, their skin is so soft. It's just, it's kind of like, <laughs> this otherworldly being. Um, Your MFA at mm -hmm. um, where? I did my MFA at Eastern Michigan University, which is um, it's about thirty minutes from where I live right now. In uh, I live in Westland, and Eastern is in Ypsilanti. Um, yeah, it took me yeah just two years to get it, and I was like that was just one of the most fun times in my life i had i spent two years mostly just doing drawings and i i didn't work much i just you know just went to school and spent time in the studio and um i think that's when i just became really confident in my drawings and i became really fast at making them so when I had my show, my MFA show at the end, it was like this, so many drawings. It was, it was a lot. It was a lot of work to hang everything. And it was, when I, when I had started my MFA, I used to draw um, empty rooms, like without any graphite, um, with no people in them. And uh, I have one example. I get I wish I had a smaller one, but this is sort of the mood that a lot of them had. Um, sort of like, uh, it's sort of like a snapshot of what a room looks like after someone has sort of run through it or or turned the lights out or, um, yeah, they were very, they're very moody. Um, I just loved, I just loved making them. I just, um, some of them were um, taller than me. I made really big ones. You can get really rolls of paper that are, you know, roll it out as long as you like and you can make a huge, a huge drawing. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I ended my BFA with, with these drawings and then how I started my MFA, which was um, not very long after. It was a few years or so. Um, but then in the middle of my MFA, I started to draw people.
And I started with myself. I thought I would do a, um, a self-portrait and because it was, you know, I was very busy doing things. So I had, I didn't, you know, really have time to ask people to pose for me. And they were taking me, at first they took a while to do, but in the same way that I did um, the empty room drawings, it was sort of, I would do work the same way. I always work from upper left corner to bottom right corner with the graphite because it keeps me from smudging my work and it also sort of keeps things like organized in my in my mind so yeah there would be parts of parts of the parts of a room that would be difficult to draw or that I would have to make really dark and I would like not look forward to those parts and with the with people it's the same way it's like working on a face or hands or you know, that way it was, it was kind of difficult, but then after a while, I just got so used to it, and it was, you know, faces kind of like, um, sort of like a, like a map, you sort of like start, and then finish, and then sometimes you got to go in and erase, and, and then highlight, or shadow, and and I, I really started to enjoy drawing people. I usually, I usually worked from photographs because they took so long to do. But, you know, that's when I, when I started to draw these people. I, I got really quite fast at it. And yeah, I have one, I have a smaller, ugh, lots of things on my desk. This is, um, I also like to work from old photos. So this was a photo of my Aunt Laura. I think this was at my my parents' wedding, I think. Um, but it was just an old photo of her. So I wasn't really sure on uh, whose wedding it was, but she was a bridesmaid. And uh, I was, when I was a, a young baby, I was adopted. So I've never looked like my family. So seeing this photo of her, looking like my dad was was really like something to me it was it was important and it was uh I just thought it was really cool because I didn't look like like my family but um yeah I really liked this one it was a nice like sort of weird framing of her in this doorway and you could see where the the flash was um from the camera so she was sort of like really brightened around her face and around her. Um, I've also, yeah, I've drawn my friends, my family. Um, usually when I draw people, I don't know their things I found from like old photos. Um, Cause those really interest me as well. You usually find them at like a, a antique shop. So I have like a, like a shoe box full of um, postcards and things and you'll find all these you know old photos that are really fascinating and some of them are just they sort of call to you to draw them and uh yeah that's was really enjoyable um they don't really sell very well because people usually don't want to buy something that um that of uh, a portrait of someone that they don't know um so, but yeah, it was, it was definitely sort of addictive. You would get into that, you know, those little details and, you know, I used to love drawing wood grain and textures and, and highlights and shadows and yeah, they were, they were just so much fun. It was just such a fun time in my life when I got my MFA and I just you know, you don't really have the opportunity in your life to just spend a couple of years doing what you love and really honing in on it and making yourself a better artist. And yeah, that time in my life was just really, it was very special. And, um, you know, you get all that attention at school from your teachers and your advisors and, you know, from like younger 
students, sometimes you'll, you'll have, um, you know, people going for their, their BFA, they'll come into your studio and, uh, you know, you'll, you look around and you tell them about your work and it, there's just like the spotlight on you. It feels like, like you're very special. And then when you graduate, it's sort of just like, <laughs> like there's, you know, there's no more safety net. It's just, you have to figure it out for yourself. I remember I did kind of struggle for a while. I just kept drawing though, because that was just what I love to do. And yeah, eventually you just kind of, I started getting into um, getting into things in pop culture, like um, like the things with the cats. started I worked with uh, 1x run which was a um, which is is a uh, is a locally run in Detroit it's a print print house they print um, they make prints from uh, artists works and they do like a like a edition of 30 or 50 and you'll be able to buy it for like a two week period and sometimes they sell out really fast and then sometimes you know when I did work with them a lot of my originals would sell really fast and and I did some prints but mostly you know when I worked with them I did these sort of small originals and and they would they would sell a lot and uh so that was sort of a boost after that MFA period um to get to work with them and they were sort of, you know, they're they're known sort of worldwide, um, you know, for finding these innovative artists. And I was, you know, I was local, so I had that sort of, you know, edge and into the into them. But um, yeah, as as all things, you know, do they come to an end and. Um, you know, and I still follow their artists and their emails, but um, I do kind of miss being, that was sort of like a little bit of a family um, thing. It was just nice to go there and um, sign the prints and, you know, um, you know, you knew with them you could, it was sort of like certainty that you would have some income. Um, so... 
after I stopped working with them, I sort of was definitely out there on my own. And I kept with the cats. I did a lot of work with, with uh, 1X1 with cats. And um, they liked more edgy stuff. So I would, you know, do these anthropomorphic cats, <laughs> like drinking beer or, or um, you know, I would, I would draw these... Uh, internet famous cats like grumpy cat or um you know try to have have a lot of fun with it and people were they were excited about that and um so you know after that i was like i sort of discovered this this uh world of cat artists somehow um i i met my friend megan lincott uh she does She's very well known in the in the cat slash art community. She does these beautiful um, watercolors of cats, and there'll be like a she'll paint like a tagline in there, like I don't know something funny about cat poop or you know something like that. And the and the cat watercolors were definitely beautiful. And I know she does she does a lot of commission work too. So um, she also. Uh, she made these um, tattoos, which are like, um, they're uh, temporary tattoos that have, you know, little cats on them. So um, I was definitely really, you know, enamored with her. And I got to meet her. Um, she came to one of my shows. She was from the Detroit area. And then she lived in, I think, in Oakland, California for a while. But she came back here to live. Um, with her husband and uh you know we we had to sort of become friends via instagram and we were always you know liking each other's work and she came to my show and you know she really liked everything and um so yeah we're still friends and uh hopefully when it gets when you know the pandemic seems to you know become less you know um when things open up more, we'll be able to do cat events again. And she was the one that kind of got me into doing the cat conventions. Um, you know, when you, you're sort of working by yourself and you're not really sure, you know, what you're doing or what you want to do and you have, you know, all these cat things and people respond a lot more to the cats than to my drawings of people. Um, I mean, people like the, like the drawings a lot. And people are sort of, people who don't know that I used to draw people are like, wow, oh, you draw people. <laughs> and they're used, mostly used to my um, fun cat stuff. And uh, so, um, and yeah, I think it was 2017, I did my first, um, cat event in uh, Miami, Florida, and that was, it was a one-day event, and I just remember getting so excited over, you know, every little sale, and, you know, I sold a big original piece, and, um, yeah, I sold some smaller pieces, and, um, yeah, it was just, so much fun you know and you get to connect with the the people that are buying your work and um yeah i think it was after that i i applied for more of these cat conventions and uh and i you know i got into a bunch of them at at the same time and i was you know i thought this could be you know something really fun and i sort of learned that it's it's been kind of a weird time for me. Some shows I did not do very well at all, and I'm not sure why that is. But I don't know. I just I think I I've decided that I'd like to do some shows and get in front of people and you know talk with them about my work and you know have them buy things, but. I've decided to sort of work on my shop, my online shop, to um, 
to sort of make it so maybe someday I could just work from home and make enough money where I don't have to work at Trader Joe's and I can um, just have my shop. Eventually, that's the dream. Um, so I'm hoping this advertising will, will help out. When you when you start doing collage, it's you, you have to start thinking like in layers. So, you know, you have your image in your mind and then you have to cut things out and arrange so that, you know, it lives up to that image in your head. And I have I let's see, I have a so my husband cut these for me. These are just regular wood and he uh the idea, the idea for collage, I think, came about because I was always working on paper and I was tired of having to frame everything, which was really expensive. And um, it's not, you know, it's not easy to store all these huge drawings. Um, so I thought, you know, I looked into um, this, this stuff, which is Mod Podge. And uh sort of. Mod Podge, and it's a, it's sort of like a glue. Um, you can brush it on with a with a, just a paintbrush. I usually like to wet it first, and then it kind of seals everything down. So that way, you don't really need to have glass or a mat or anything around. You just have your your piece. And so sometimes I work from like found pieces of wood, but this is my husband's work he did the little um decorative edge so here is sort of the next stage i usually spray paint them spray paint the the whole surface that way the um the wood is not exposed and that way everything sort of just adheres better to the paint to the painted wood and then I have these. I have just tons of, of art paper. Um, this one is wood. It's always good. I always have like a collection of things like wood and grass and um, brick and, you know, things that are, you know, from the from the world, you know, because some of it is just, um, you know, patterned and colorful like this. So I also like, I have all these different pads of paper, and this one came from a pad, this sort of um, old lady wallpaper look. And yeah, I like to, you know, really sort of create a mood um, with the piece. And that really starts with this paper substrate that you put down before anything else. Um, I'm also working on This is going to be like a haunted house. So I like to do fun Halloween stuff. I find that it, it sells really well and that I have a lot of fun doing it. So it's good for it's good for everybody. And I have these um, small pads of paper um, where these different pattern papers came from. And uh, there's the, the brick. I usually try to have some brick paper on hand. And um, yeah, I thought that the attic would get, you know, the the spider web paper treatment, and then, you know, some of these are just sort of old, old looking. Um, some of them have like, they look like they've been, you know, treated. This one has a cool um, sort of like a felt or velvety pattern that you can feel on it. So some papers like that. I usually most papers just. Um, just flat. Sometimes it'll have like a little bit of a, a bead to it or um, texture. If I want something with more texture, I can I can definitely find it. I have a lot of um, scraps that I keep. I have the pads and I have scraps and I have um, big large sheets that I bought. Um, so these are you know, just some of the scraps. I have a Frida Kahlo paper. 
I also like to, sometimes I like to have trees. So I have this tree, birch tree look. And then I have just basic black and kind of group them, try to organize them by color so I don't go bananas trying to trying to find, you know, the right background. Um, but yeah, that's how they start out. And you just uh, brush this on and then, you know, let it dry. Sometimes I'll have them dry upside down um, so that there's no bubbles. And sometimes there are bubbles. I remember this one, uh, the edge sort of bubbled up over here. But I found that if you just give it a day and you relax <laughs> and you don't, you just leave it alone, that a lot of times the it'll just straighten itself out. It just needs time and, you know. And I also use a little, little squeegee like this sometimes, sort of dirty, <laughs> to get all, all the bubbles out if I have like a difficult piece of paper I'm working with. But, um, and then from there, it's, it's just about the, it's about the cat and what's the cat doing. And, um, like this one, I used a lot of different papers. Like I, these are cut up pieces of paper. And then this is a photograph I found of my husband's cat when he was a little kitten. And there's also all these things that I get at um, at Michael's. It's like a craft store. And they have little um, cardboard frames. They also do, I've done a series of, um, oh, I have things like, like this. little crowns so that you know when you're trying to give your piece some personality you got a lot I just collect a lot of things um so I can you know pick and choose and sometimes I found things like I pick up things like from the ground <laughs> sometimes when I go running I'll see a little piece of something and I'll I'll think I can use it and I'll you know you let it dry out or you spray it so it it's become it's not so you know garbage looking <laughs> and uh yeah so there's really no limit on the things that i that i see and if you know i think if i can use it in a in a collage i'll keep it and I'll, i have this big um set of drawers where i keep a lot of my different stuff and um, one thing i like to use sometimes is glasses Put, um, you know, to anthropomorphize your cat, put some glasses on it. And uh, I have my, this one has my old glasses, this little cat. Um, but I do find, like, at the Lost and Found at work, there's a lot of glasses in there. And sometimes I'll just, you know, if it's been sitting there a while, I'll just help myself and use the fun glasses that are in there. And, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, I don't know, they just make me laugh, cats and glasses, I, I, it's adorable, like, when you see, like, a small kid, like, a really small baby with glasses on, and they, they just look so cute, <laughs> they look like, like a mini adult or something, I don't know, and with cats, it's sort of the same way, it just, I don't know, makes me smile, and, uh, yeah, so, when, yeah, um, yeah, things like, like this one, this is an actual, like, little tea set that I use. I use a lot of super glue. That's how I get, um, these little things to sit here and, you know, not move. Because a lot of times I have to, I'll ship them, and I have to be sure that they're not going to move or, you know, fall off or break. I recently did did this little piece, which is sort of, let me get it, yeah, you can see. Um, there's a piece 
uh, by Robert Smithson. It's like um, the movement was called Earth Art, or I think it was in the 70s. And he did this uh, piece called Spiral Jetty. And it was, you know, like a spiral of Earth um, that you made. And I think it's in Idaho. And it's this, it's still there and you can still see it. Um, but I decided to make my own and call it Spiral Kitty because it has little cat ears. And these are all, um, I collect rocks. So I have um, rocks and shells and things when I um, want to make something more, look more um, naturalistic or if I'm doing like something beachy or something from where the cat is outdoors. I like to sort of, you know, add a little bit of nature to it so that it, it's so it's realistic, but yet yeah, sort of funny. And I don't know. This is one of my yeah. I love art history. So I like, think things like this they sort of you know crack me up um, a little bit. So yeah, just a lot of super glue. <laughs> this collage is good, and the drawings you know I do um, separately. I find the right size of paper I want to use. Like for this one, I'm doing um, a cat laying on a rug. So I have this, this is like the, the view is uh, top down, like looking right on top of the cat. So the cat will be like, you know, sprawled out, happy, happy cat on a rug. And um, so it's sort of, you know, definitely a more, more of a flat composition, but I do have these little, I found these at uh, Michael's, they're little wool balls, something, they, so they look kind of like cat toys. So I was gonna put some of those around the cat, like he's, you know, blissed out in the middle of all his toys. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I'll have to find a piece of paper, cut a piece of paper about this size, and then draw the cat on there. and. I used to spray fix the drawing before, but um, I found if I work with with pencil and with colored pencil, um, if I don't spray it at first, I can get some kind of, um, like it makes the fur look sort of blended and more natural with like, if it bleeds a little bit with the, uh, with the addition of the, of the Mod Podge on top. So, um, that allows it allows me to sort of skip a step. Um, if I need something to be really, really precise, or really, or if it's like a white cat or something that I can't really let the color bleed all over, um, I might spray fix it before um, before I add it to the to the um, to the wood. Um, yeah, there's um, there is. Um, a shop in, or it's not really a shop, it's sort of like a, this uh, place in Detroit and you can get sort of um, distressed pieces of wood or um, that kind of thing. And um, that's great for finding like really unique um, pieces that are not so um, cut out and perfect. Because sometimes you, it's, it really helps the piece if it's sort of on this rough hewn, um, sort of battered down, you know, piece of wood, which is, you know, it's it's unique to find those, and it's it usually really adds to a piece. And there's a um, there's a place I like to shop in uh, Ferndale, um, in Ferndale, Michigan, and it has it's in. It's called the Rust Belt Market, and they have this one shop. Um, they have a bunch of shops inside, but there's one shop that has, um, like, they have all kinds of things. They have, like, old patches or um, <clears throat> some, they have a, they always have a, a box full of, um, like, animal bones. <laughs> so sometimes um, I've worked with animal bones from, from there before. Um, Sometimes they have really cool sunglasses that are just, you know, like really unique that you cannot find, you know, anywhere else. And 
Yeah, so I've gotten a lot of cool stuff from there. Um, yeah, I love small, like, antique shops, especially. When I've traveled, there's a, there's an antique shop in Austin, Texas. And when I go there, it's just, it's like, it's like heaven in there. There's so much uh, fun little miniature stuff that you can, that you can find. And um, I remember I got this little piece, which is like a, it's a piece of paper <laughs> with a little paper jug and little paper flowers. So it could like, you know, easily go into a collage. And uh, I just saw this, I was like, man, I gotta have that. Cause it's like, it's, you know, handmade, you know, very one of a kind um, object, you know. And also they have, you know, it's a great place to find like old pictures, old postcards, you know, things that you can add to the background or sometimes I've used like doilies like old lace doilies. Um, yeah, using those like antique stores or secondhand stores are are places that are just so full of um, inspiration, just like waiting to happen. I just love going to those places. Yeah, it's one of, you know, it's one of those places that really brings out, you know, your, all your ideas and creativity and like, oh, I could do this, I can do this around this, you know, one little piece of, you know, interesting, you know, this little found object, you know, it's very, that makes, I think that makes collage kind of the most fun, is like all the hunting <laughs> you have to do to find things. Um, that's definitely part of the fun. Um, yeah, it's definitely part of the whole artistic process is, you know, finding things and collecting them and, yeah, get putting them where you can, you know, you can easily access and make, use, use it to make a composition around. Um, yeah, I use, um, sometimes I go to Ikea, which is the, the, um, the Swedish uh, furniture place, and they have a, what do they call it? The they have like a sale area or like a scratch and dent area, and usually the furniture is kind of sparse and not looking great. But I used to get a lot of uh, cabinet doors there. Um, if I could find one that's like you know the right size and it has like already has like a nice border on it, um, and just turn those into into um, the background for a piece. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun to go there or go, you know, where you can, um, you know, seek out shops that have that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, it's definitely part of the fun. Yeah. It's, you know, I, yeah, especially the past few years, it's just really hard. Um, to find your audience, you know, to, you know, find out who, who they are, what do they want, and um, I had that's something in my mind, and I sort of, <laughs> um, but yeah, when you're, you're out, doodle, okay, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's the thing, like, that feeling of when you, when you graduate from school and then you're out there and it's like, what do I do with this? You know, and it's, I found it's very hard to get into galleries and get gallery representation, um, you know, cause you, you never really know what they want or, you know, what they're looking for. Um, you know, it's best if you're, I've tried, okay, let's sit down. You know, you definitely have to do your research on galleries. That way it, it saves you like a lot of um, heartache and, and uh, you know, a lot of that sort of hassle of, you know, making up a artist statement and the, you know, get your, getting your portfolio together. And a lot of that is more online now, um, but it's still sort of, you know, you're always just like waiting for that rejection which is hard um 
I think for me, deciding to just go on my own and have my own shop um, has really helped me a lot artistically. Um, yeah, but when yeah sales dry up like it is right now, it's sort of really disheartening. And you know, there's a lot there's a lot of artists that are like out there on Etsy and such that you know they you know they find that works for them and they sell a lot and um, you know and that's great. But it's it's sort of hard nowadays to find um, to find your audience to find people that, you know, like what you do, that like your pri your price points, you know, that, you know, take you seriously. And, um, yeah, a lot of that has, has definitely been a struggle over the past few years. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll, you know, have the best time at a, at an event. And then sometimes you'll just, um, you know, you won't, ba won't barely sell anything and you know you'll see your friends are doing well and it's just like sort of you know exhausting <laughs> it can be exhausting and yeah when you spend you know so much money and um on art supplies and uh you know all the time that goes into it it can really be you know disheartening and and sad to just you know, not be able to, you know, make a success out of yourself. Do you think you're, you, you will evolve? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not really that young anymore. I am 44. <laughs> um, I feel like, yeah, I'm kind of wondering you know, where will this go? I do have um, a couple of events um, scheduled for next year. And there was one year where I tried to do like eight events. And that was when I had some real big up and downs and, and traveling was, you know, it, you get used to traveling and, and it, at times it's really fun. But sometimes, you know, when you're with your husband and you're lugging around your artwork it's it's really tiring and and it you know it's you're wondering is this really worth it and I think that um you know trying to do my shop from home um that's what I've been working on lately and trying to develop that and but I really do like to travel and I I have a couple shows um that are next next year i know i think my next show isn't until next spring though um and that's in chicago and i'm really excited about that one um usually chicago is is you know pretty catty place it's it has a fistful of you know people who love cats and um it'll be sort of a new venue for me too so i'm looking forward to that it's it's good when the venue is sort of in the city, because sometimes when they're at some convention far outside of a city, you know, you don't get any foot traffic. You know, you have to have these people that are planning to come. And, you know, that can be sort of, you know, when it when you have a event that's really poorly attended, you know, that's really hard as well. Um, one event I'm looking forward to is going to San Diego to do a cat event because San Diego is sort of well known for its uh, its uh, Comic Con, um, so the comic you know convention. I think a cat event there would just would hopefully it'll be really great. And you know I had decided last year before like as the pandemic was sort of happening, I, my husband and I had chosen like some shows to do, and we were going to make vacations sort of around them. Um, to make it more of like a whole experience instead of just getting there and lugging stuff and doing the show and then, you know, going home. Um, so I'm hoping to make these events sort of count and just make them a fun experience. If, you know, if it doesn't go well, it's, it's like, oh, well, we had this great time, you know, and it was fun. Um, oh, yeah. So I, I thought of that before, like, what 
what do I do when I'm, if I get tired of cats, you know, what, and it's kind of interesting because I did, um, I did a commission for a friend, um, earlier in the spring and I did one of my old, um, I did, I worked from a black and white photo that he had and it was, it was an old woman in Mexico. He's from Mexico and his, his mother was one of two, was one of a, a set of twins. So the grandma was holding the babies in her arms and it was this really nice black and white photo of her and the babies were so tiny and, and she was, she had this sort of stern expression, but when, you know, you close in or you do a close up and you really look at her face, it was this, you know, deep concern and, and worry almost. Um, so I, I went back to, you know, what I did in, in graduate school and drew upon all that to make this new portrait. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of people who don't, who didn't know that I made portraiture in that way. So I mean, it's always something, you know, that I could focus on on my website. You know, I also do this work or, but I'm, you know, sort of at this point where, yeah, I need to, uh, but I think, you know, I think I will evolve. And I love this sort of definitely the, the combination of drawing and collage. Um, and that could, you know, definitely lead to, to different things um but i always see myself as drawing i don't think i could ever just take drawing out of the equation of how i work it's just too it's too fun for me it's too you know i love my style and it's taken a while to um you know get to this point so um yeah i don't know where i'll go from here i definitely kind of sticking with cats for the moment. Um, I do draw dogs as well. I do, I take uh, portrait commissions from people. Um, so I, I mean, a lot of that has, has sort of dried up as well with the pandemic and all, but um, you know, when someone's cat dies or if someone wants to do a nice gift for a friend, that's an always, you know, I always say, hey, you know, I do this, you know, um, get me pictures, that's all I need, you know, to do a, a nice memorial or, you know, I, I just, you know, I love making people happy by doing nice portraits of their cats. I was, I've always been definitely, you know, in, into graphite, you know, when you're starting out, like, in a, you know, when I started to get my BFA, you know, you draw, take these, all these life drawing classes and you work with so many different mediums, you know, you have like a, like a stick of charcoal, you have the vine charcoal, which is very loose and, and kind of crumbly. And, um, the thing that, that really drew me to, uh, graphite instead of, um, charcoal and, and other methods, um, I really like the, the sharpness that you can get from a pencil. And I love to, I used to have a bunch of different um, sharpeners for my pencils. Cause I, you know, sometimes they, the, the, I would get frustrated, the graphite would break. With certain brands, they, they'll they break faster than, than others. So um, I found that if I get, if I get um, a slightly bigger pencil um, with a, with a um, very soft graphite, I get a lot of the um, the effects that I want faster than if I just keep like slowly building. And and a lot of people used to ask me if my drawings were charcoal, and uh, they were surprised that it was that it was graphite because um, I I pretty heavy handed, um, so I like my darks to be you know dark darks, but I really love to get. Um, all the detail that you can with the pencil. Um, and I also like to uh, use an eraser to sort of erase back into uh, certain areas to make a, a nice highlight or, um, yeah. So yeah, I do love, I love colored pencil as well. Um, I'm not quite 
as good with colored pencil as, as like people who work with it all the time. But, um, yeah, I do go back in, um, I found with, with the collages, I, you know, I cut out my piece and then I, I glue it down. A lot of times I've been going over, um, with pen to make it sort of a lot darker. So I use like a micron pen, which is a pretty, um, small tip on it and it it kind of gives me those really dark darks and then I'll use a white pen to sort of highlight and but I found that you know if I if I sort of skimp on the graphite or the colored pencil before I cut it out sometimes I'll get the I won't get all the in-between sort of shades and and textures that that I like so you really got it it's got to be a strong drawing you know, before you cut it out. And yeah, I just, I don't know, I just like the control of it. I remember um, being in a, a painting class and I just didn't like it as much. Even with those really small brushes, I felt like it was sort of like removed, slightly removed from, from the canvas. It would just seem sort of not as, definitely not as easy for me. And I just really, you know, love getting in close with the with the pencil and, you know, I, so I did okay with painting, but yeah, definitely not my favorite thing to do. So yeah, I find drawing is with, you know, being able to control the, the medium is definitely important to me and to my technique. Oh, I've, I've always, ever since I was, you know, ever since I was like in, in art school, um, I found that, you know, one of my goals is to always make an interesting piece. So I've always, you know, tried to, uh, make an interesting composition, um, something that's sort of unexpected. Um, yeah, definitely composition is, having an interesting composition is important to me. Um, there's sort of these uh, like rules of art that you're supposed to follow, but um, it's also kind of fun to, to break the rules and to, you know, do, do what you want, you know, just, um, like usually, you know, having your piece be so, you know, symmetrical is not as interesting, but it'll end up as an interesting piece, I think. Um, yeah, I definitely try to go for something unexpected. Um, I know people, you know, they, working this way with the collage and the, and the drawing, you know, people think it's really complicated, but, you know, after a while of doing it, it's just, um, you know, it just becomes like your second nature. And so, um, you know, achieving all these, these, you know, goals or guidelines that, that I try to adhere to, you know, you kind of get into, a habit of just trying, you know, you have that, you know, you gotta, that going through your mind, you gotta make it interesting, you gotta pick interesting materials, um, you know, do the unexpected, um, that's one thing I've always tried to, to follow, you know, to keep, to keep things from getting too, um, stale or, um, I like to, and a lot of artists make a lot of different pieces that kind of look the same. Um, and I try to kind of avoid that. Um, yeah, I just, you know, go for the unique, go for the unexpected. That's definitely one of my, um, one of my goals when I make art. Um, one of the beautiful things that you've done with cats is that you show them in such positive 
manner, such positive light. I talk about cats. Oh, I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> it's <laughs> you know, not really the cat. It's yeah. the fur. It's a certain thing There's that's in the fur. All these superstitions mm -hmm. still exist. Yeah. Um, one thing it's, that's really funny is that I'm allergic to cats, and I'm uh, really allergic. So every week I go and I get a shot in my arm <laughs> so that I can, you know, continue to live with my cats. I used to be really bad and I've had like two surgeries on my nose and I know it's not just cats that there's other factors like dust and um, that where I work is really dusty and it's, it's bad. And, um, you know, I know there's things in the air, like I'll go running and I'll, you know, just be outside for a bit and I just start sneezing and, and, but I've, you know, managed it. Um, okay, you know, I've gotten used to my cats. Um, the best thing you can do for cats is just try to groom them and, um, you know, make it so that, you know, vacuum a lot. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny how people that are, that say, oh, I'm allergic or, you know, I, or I don't want to, you know, be around cats. And, and it's funny, those are the people that cats, you know, are, like going to because everyone else is like oh I love you and then and then you know the allergic person will be like kind of shrinking away and the cat really goes towards that person because they're not like in their face you know it's somebody that's you know sort of aloof like them you know and they'll be attracted to that but yeah I found that yeah I, I had this doctor and he was uh who I was seeing for my asthma and he he couldn't believe that I, you know, would allow my cats to sleep with me. And I just thought, what a sad life <laughs> you must have. Just sort of like, he's like, if you're okay with being on all this medication and, and such, you know, it's like, I just love these creatures. Why, why wouldn't I, you know, try to make myself comfortable, you know, so that I can live with them. Cause they're definitely wonderful for, for depression and for anxiety and, and that kind of thing, but yeah, I felt this doctor was sort of like, I thought I was like a big weirdo for, you know, living with cats, even when I'm allergic, and it's like, you know, it's just, it's just small, you know, bump in the road, so yeah, I, you know, I, I definitely have to take care of my allergies, and I do, um, but yeah, I was sort of like appalled by this doctor who's like, yeah, you got can't let your cat sleep with you. <laughs> I'm just like, you tell them that, you know, because they just love it up there. And they don't sleep on my face or anything, but, you know, to have them like cuddle in your arms is just, is like the best thing. And, um, yeah, one thing about, um, at least about this country, um, there's so much like terrible violence and, and such that, y you know, you watch all these, these shows about all these murders and, how these murderers and psycho killers and serial killers come to be. And it's, you know, a lot of them, you know, before they start to hurt people, they'll hurt cats and they'll hurt dogs and, and, you know, small rodents. And, and it's really kind of sick, but it's, it's like a, like a part of their, you know, how they become who they are is that they, you know, harm defenseless animals. And it's, you know, you should, I think, you know, the law should really take into account, you know, I think it's a felony now in most states to uh, kill cats or, and small animals and that. So, you know, that, that's kind of going in the right direction, but I think so many people, you know, they, they don't see animals as, as beings. They just see them as things, but, you know, to, try to kill them it's just this weird rush they get or something it's just really it's a sign of real sickness I think um but yeah having yeah it's and I just I mean for me it's like I get upset if I see like a dead cat on the side of the road or I always drive real slow down my neighborhood because I have uh, a few cats that I look out for and I I feed in my yard um and I, you know, I know how cats are and they can easily get spooked and run across the street. And so it's like, you know, kind of have to do your part and, you know, give them a chance. Um, 
But yeah, throughout history, man, it's like, it's like, you know, the cat has been worshipped and then cat has been, you know, vilified. And, and, you know, some of my, I do, I do a lot of fun Halloween stuff with uh, black cats. And, and uh, to me, I mean, I just love doing that. It's, you know, to, I was going to go to, uh, to Salem, Massachusetts and do uh, a fun event with one of my friends. And she does this, um, it's called Witch City Kitty. And it's, it's this, you know, two day event of, of, uh, in this, in this, um, sort of antique hotel and, and everything's about, you know, black cats. And I mean, so many people come to Salem, you know, probably cause it's known for the witch trials, but you yeah. know, the people, there's people that really love black cats. A lot of them, and I'm one of them. And, uh, you know, they just, they have a charm about them. That's just. <laughs> you know they can see my first cat who was all black and he was very aloof and he had his own day plan and you know he he was definitely a character but my my latest cat who you see seen in, in the video she's just sort of a little nut she's she's only five so she kind of like is a little bit of a you know spastic cat and she gets real excited by toys and she'll just you know do do the funniest little things and go nuts and and it's anything but your typical what you would call like a bad luck scary black cat she's so just you know hilarious to to watch and definitely not you know um what people think of as as a stereotypical you know mean black cat and i you know i never have really had any kind of superstition so you know, I, I'm definitely one of the more, you know, worshiping <laughs> cat worshipers of, of people, you know, um, you know, being that crazy cat lady is, it's fun, you know, it's, um, it's, I think it's becoming a lot more accepted these days is you're not like, it's not this sort of always portrayed as this unmarried woman who's sort of unkempt and has a million cats running around it's you know you can have you can have your cats and you can you know you can be married you can have children you know you can still be you know an awesome cat lady and um but yeah there's definitely like a a negative um a negative thing about black cats i think a lot of people i've heard on like people who um or try to be influential on Instagram. They they don't want black cats because they say they can't photograph them well, and that's sort of like it's sort of a dumb excuse as to not you know getting a black cat for yourself. So I don't know. That just seems really bizarre to me. I get pretty good um, pictures of Doodle when she's not when she's not moving. Um, but yeah, I mean it's sort of part of their their allure is just like mysterious, you know, they're, you know, it's hard to capture that in a photograph anyway, you know. So my other two cats are both um, very white and fluffy <laughs> and the combination of them, they're kind of older with Doodle, is just like a, a fun little family of cats. Um, yeah, but I never really, you know, understood the the vilifying of cats and I think like in in movies and such I remember one movie that came out oh, I think it was in the it might have been the 90s early early aughts um it was called cats and dogs I think and the cats were of course like you know the the evil the evil doers and the you know the trying to end the world and everything and the dogs of course were the uh the sa the saviors of the day so i don't know that's just sometimes when i see movies like that it just doesn't it does not interest me it's not like you know it's not what what i see when i'm at home you know i see you know loving adorable cats who just you know do their own thing and are adorable and you know I don't know. I don't know why people would be mean to cats. It's sort of, 
I don't know, that kind of thing is a, is a mystery to me, but I'm definitely, you know, um, pro cat. <laughs> and I, I like dogs too. They're, they're okay. I like smaller dogs, dogs that are like cat sized <laughs> and that don't bark a lot. I don't know. I said, I feel like the people are around my neighborhood that have dogs. It's like, they're always yelling at them. And it's just like, you know, I never yell at my cat, you know, <laughs> even if they, you know, they, they have a, a hairball or something, it's not their fault. You know, you, I just, I don't know, yelling at my cat seems sort of not very smart. <laughs> it gets them, you know, afraid of me, which I definitely, I definitely don't want, you know, 